everyone. Welcome to the 267th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have an excellent show for you today. We're going to be talking about a privacy bill making its way through the Senate in response to some of the contact tracing apps out there. There's also a rumored acquisition in the industrial IoT security market we'll talk about. And Kevin wants to know if the smart home is finally going to gain some common sense. Because it is, you know, just another week, we're going to be talking about a security threat for the IoT. We're also going to be questioning if Bluetooth really is the right way to go about doing contact tracing. And we've got some little bits of news from Nordic Semiconductor, Nest, Ring, and Automatic. Plus, this week's guest is Christine Sunu from Twilio. She is the creator of Soured.io, and she tells us how to build our own connected IoT project. Christine has worked with Particle and with Twilio building stuff, and she knows what she's talking about. So if you're interested in taking on a project and you're like me and you've never done it before, this is a good place to start. We're also going to hear from our sponsor, Vary, on the use of data science and do's and don'ts in the IoT. So now let's take a quick moment and hear from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is LiveWorks. This is the definitive event for digital transformation. And in light of the global coronavirus pandemic, LiveWorks 2020 has been reimagined as a complimentary virtual event. This is going to be an inspiring new digital format, and you won't have to travel, enabling you to participate remotely from anywhere in the world. And if you like me, I will also be speaking at this event and would love for you to join me. So visit LiveWorks, L-I-V-E-W-O-R-X dot com for more information. Okay, Kevin, it is time to talk about this week's installment of the COVID-19 news, basically. I hate to say it, but we probably should talk about it every week. So until it, until it's week, gone, yes. <laughs> until it's gone. It's a big deal. So this week, actually, this happened last week. It was Thursday when our podcast goes live, but we record on Wednesdays. So Thursday, Senate Commerce Committee Chairman Roger Wicker said that he and a couple other Republicans were looking at introduce legislation to regulate how companies are going to be doing contact tracing for the coronavirus. And the idea here is a narrowly targeted privacy bill to help citizens avoid being surveilled by companies deploying these apps. What's interesting about this approach is that the lawmakers might be making this a part of an upcoming stimulus package, in which case a lot of legislators will, will kind of have to look at this and, and debate and decide over this as opposed to a bill that is introducing goes nowhere. So I'm curious to see if they do that, because we typically don't see that with, with privacy type legislation. Yeah, we usually see it when people try to shoehorn weird bridges and such, or maybe terrible actions that are very partisan into bills. It would be good for privacy to get some regulations on the books. This is going to be very narrow, so we'll see how this works. And for people wondering about this, this is not just, you know, Google and Apple did say that they are working together on a Bluetooth-based framework for contact tracing using their phones. Consumers could opt in and basically they would get notifications if they passed anyone who were later found to have the coronavirus. As long as those so, people were using the app as well, or an yes, app. Yeah. Using an app and self-reporting it. So and, and the way it works is it would take it, – it basically, when you're traveling around and you have your Bluetooth on, it also happens when you have your Wi-Fi on, what happens is the phones are constantly pinging each other. And these these tracing apps would look for those pings and they would determine whether or not you were close enough. And some of the more sophisticated ones might even deal with like the amount of time you passed with someone. And basically, you would just get a notification. It says, hey, you came in contact with or you were near – Someone who's been diagnosed with COVID-19, which yeah. honestly is a little terrifying. The fact that you're being traced that way or the fact that you passed somebody who has that, been- That notification is a little terrifying. Okay, good, good. I agree. You're like, now what do I do? <laughs> what I do like about that whole approach though, and, and this the legislature is kind of linked to some of the privacy aspects of it. There's no centralized 
government organization that gets the data and it does not include your actual location nor who you are. And that's part of what this legislation is. They want to make sure that your privacy is protected in this particular instance. Yes. What you should look for is none of these need location. So no location data, no identifiable data about you. So until you actually commit to saying you have been infected, you're not, well, you're never identified. If you're infected, your token basically starts, the token that represents you connects with all the tokens that it had passed that represent other people and then communicates with them. So it would be very difficult to tie it back to a person. Not impossible, but difficult. The other things that Apple and Google have both said that they're only going to use this data for this particular purpose, and they shut it down at the end of the pandemic, which, you know, could be a while, but that's good thinking there. We're going to use this, actually. I'll, I'll segue into another one of our stories because I think it's important to understand what this can and cannot do. And The Intercept put out a story that I felt like it was a little over the top. It Basically, the headline was, the inventors of Bluetooth say there could be problems using their tech for coronavirus contact tracing. And I'm like, yeah, that's obvious. And for people who don't understand Bluetooth, here's why it's a little tricky. When you deal with Bluetooth, you're dealing with radio signals. And RF is fickle. It is <laughs> when it passes through walls, the signals change. When it passes through people, because we're just giant bags of salt water, and it's very difficult for most signals to get through giant bags of salt water, it changes. It's not like you can draw an even and straight line between two people and say, you were 30 feet apart from this person for this long. It would be nice if that were the case, but that is not how Bluetooth really works. That's not how any wireless signal really works. I guess lasers. <laughs> <laughs> right. LiDAR works differently. But... Correct, correct. But everything you've said is is correct. There, people don't realize the variability of radio frequencies depending on location, depending on going through a wall, how thick the wall is, what the wall material is. There's so many factors. How many other people are around you? I mean, whenever you're in a crowded conference building or area with a lot of people all trying to get online, you'll notice that your battery drains faster. That's because you're trying. the antennas are trying to push out more signal to compensate for all of the clutter and noise in the environment. So this is not like, this is variable. It happens. It's a guess. That's the thing. Nobody has ever promised that this is the perfect solution, that the whole Bluetooth, you know, wireless frequency tracking. There is no perfect solution short of having physical tests that are readily available, right? And contact tracers. Like people and contact who tracers. go and right. interview you. This is a good way to start building out a map. It is a good way to start thinking about hotspots, possibly. Although we're not using location, so you can't see hotspots, you have to bring the person in and interview them to get that information. It's a good way to get people, I guess, thinking about things, aware of things. It is. I do have one concern. The reliance of RSSI or signal strength with Bluetooth for these apps, as we've already said, is highly variable. And I wonder how many false positives it could lead to. That's erring on the side of caution, which I think is a good thing, but... Still, some people may panic when they shouldn't be panicked. Yeah. And app developers can actually work around this. They can, and you'll have to decide, do you want more false positives and a greater number of people coming in and getting tested? I mean, presuming we ever have enough tests here in the US, but that's a decision we're going to have to make. But what will happen is, I mean, if I just walk by someone how likely is it, and I'm outside, am I going to, is it likely that I'm infected even though they, they pass by and I might get a notification? It's unlikely. If I sit next to someone in a restaurant with air conditioning, way more likely. And there's no way to account for that right now. And Bluetooth isn't the way to account for that. You're going to have to build algorithms on top of these apps that make those decisions. So, you know, it's not just Bluetooth. And the intercept kind of makes it sound like it is just Bluetooth. Although the, in the story, they also talk about, you know, the number of people who download this. This is all very contingent on getting greater than 60% of the population to opt in, which I think is quite ambitious at the best. I think that is ambitious. Is there enough self-incentive for people to do it? The people who think that their data is going to be used inappropriately, they're not going to download, download this no matter what. There's a high percentage of people that probably think that. So I don't think they're going to hit the 60 this goes back to the law. Maybe the law will help with that. Yeah. Maybe it won't. Anyway, 
Okay, so that's what's going on with the the COVID nineteen contact tracing situation. Let's talk about an industrial IoT security firm possibly getting purchased by Microsoft. Woo! All right, Israeli business newspaper Globes has reported that a company called CyberX is in talks with Microsoft to be acquired for one hundred and sixty five million dollars. And this is a big deal, and uh, there's a couple reasons. One, CyberX is actually a really solid name in industrial IoT security. They do the operational technology security, which is that how machines are talking to machines, not how computers are talking to computers, but the machines to machines kind of. I'm getting stuck here with like, I'm like, oh, machines to machines, and everyone's thinking, oh, cellular. But no, this is the deep machine talking in a in a factory setting. This is those devices talking to each other over their own dedicated network. So CyberX secures that and focuses there. Microsoft buying it would be a big deal because it puts Microsoft lower in the stack for industrial IoT. Microsoft has historically worked with vendors in the OT side to secure and to you know, communicate with machines and to translate back and forth, but it hasn't really wanted to go super deep. And I think part of that reason is because it's very hard for the world of IT to go down into the OT stack. And we've talked about that on the show and in the newsletter a lot. But if Microsoft does end up buying CyberX, that's exactly what would be happening. And Microsoft is the number one cloud provider for the industrial IoT. I know AWS is the number one cloud overall, but Microsoft really has won here. And I think that's important to note, and this would just build on that for them. So we'll see if that actually happens. I have emailed CyberX and Microsoft, and I have not heard back from them. But my hunch is they're going to say, we do not comment on acquisitions. (laughs) It'll be a nice payday because the uh, company was founded in 2013 and it's raised $48 million. So 165 million is pretty good. Yeah, I'd take it. I imagine many companies would take anything right now. At this point, yes. I'm like, oh, it's about to get rough. Let's talk about the smart home because, well, it's a day that ends in Y and (laughs) we're on the show together. Kevin, you found this article and I kind of like it. It's an interesting article. I mean, it certainly appealed to me because the the title of it, and it comes from Quanta Magazine. My favorite magazine. I love this magazine, you guys. Okay, go on. Okay. (laughs) Common sense comes closer to computers. Aside from the alliteration in the title, it's a really good article um, that's well worth the read. And it has to do with, well, the the title says it all. Computers don't have common sense, but yet we're training them to recognize objects with machine vision. We're training them to do natural language processing, but the missing piece is common sense, and that's very hard to program. So what was interesting here is actually came up with a a tweet about uh, somebody testing some common sense and natural language processing, and it said something along the lines of uh, somebody is, you know, using matches, putting logs together, et cetera, you know, what happens next, essentially. And a computer really couldn't tell you that. However, somebody saw the tweet, and they have a research project called Comet that is meant to perform common sense reasoning. So they fed in the same prompt from the tweet, and here's what they said. They said, Gary stacks kindling and logs and drops some matches. And basically, the Comet system came up with all kinds of inferences of why Gary might be doing this. The first two were he wanted to start a fire or he wanted to make a fire. So there's common sense there. It explains what the computer is thinking is going to happen and is probably correct. That's what's missing to me in the smart home. And the article doesn't talk about the smart home, but I'm thinking ahead and like, wow, if we had these kind of systems with a little common sense in the smart home, you know, where it sees somebody take out certain ingredients out of the fridge, for example, it says, oh, it looks like that person is about to make salmon. Let me start the oven. You know, you get the kind of place I'm going to there. I was like, maybe recipes are a little hard, but seeing like, let's say a bunch of people come to the door, then it, it might be like, oh, there's a bunch of people here. The room is going to get hot. Let's turn down the AC and it's right. probably a party. Bingo. Although you wouldn't want it to go too far on party because maybe it's like a wake. And that would be bad. 
Yeah, that would be interesting to have the Hue Light disco ball function going. When be like, mm, yeah. no, not not the best bit of common sense there. But turning down the air would be helpful. Yeah, but a- anyway, it's a very good article. Um, it goes into a lot more depth than we can talk about here due to time. I would love to see more development in the smart home based on common sense. Wouldn't we all? I would love mm. to just see more common sense in general. That's <laughs> in true. the world around me from people. <laughs> Let's move to security. Oh, guess what? Another day, another botnet. This botnet is interesting because it targets IoT devices. It uses SSH, brute force attacks. Oh, and it's called Kaiji. And it's interesting because it was built from scratch. This is not a run-of-the-mill, I just downloaded it from the dark web somewhere. This is built in Go, which is why people, and there, there are not a lot of these out there. So people are like, oh. This is interesting. They've built something new. What's a little disturbing is it's probably still evolving because, well, you're building something new. You're probably going to deploy it, see how well it works, and then, you know, make the changes. But the way this works is it uses SSH. Not telling it. (laughs) The way this works is it uses exposed SSH ports, not telling it, our favorite form of attack. And it executes brute force attacks against your IoT devices and Linux servers. So this isn't like your your sensors. This is like your router. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And maybe if you have a DVR system, our favorite network DVR system that is old and unsecured. Are people still using those? Yes, they are. (sighs) I mean, stop. From their perspective, if you're like a bodega, you know, and you've got a network DVR thing from like the, I don't know late aughts, it ain't broke. Don't, you know, why fix it? Well, it it is broke. <laughs> but yeah, I, but they don't I see know. it being broke. No, I, I understand. Yeah. I'm sure Google's not too thrilled with this because typically these exploits are in, in C or C++, but because this is Go, which was designed at Google back in 2009, <laughs> they probably don't want to be associated with this. Yeah. So if you're worried about this, this targets... Servers that have left their SSH port exposed on the internet. So lock that down. Only the root account is targeted. Which and- is the most important one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the big mama. Don't worry about it. It's just the root account. But what it's going to do is it's going to infect all the devices that the targeted device controls. And and it, and it does that so it can use do more brute force attacks. So it has more broadband or bandwidth for brute force attacks, but it also steals any of the local SSH keys that are on that device. And then it spreads to the other devices the root account has managed in the past. Yeah. That's, that's actually rather clever and smart. Not that I and condone this. Really a problem. <laughs> and, and a big problem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is something to keep an eye on Kaiji and we'll be looking for See, if there was common sense involved, the systems would say, you know what? I don't really think you're an active user or or an authenticated user. That's true. If you have anything on your network that's going to look at device behavior and be like, Mm -hmm. why is all this bandwidth going up all of a sudden from this DVR? Why is this traffic? Why is this calling out to this? Why is there so much traffic going around inside my network? Why is my DVR trying to talk to my refrigerator? What's happening? Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's our that's our little advocate for, I guess, common sense security, which does exist, although it's a little more rare on the home side. Okay, let's talk about news, Kevin. Yeah, so we're hearing a lot about IoT and medical devices these days because of COVID-19. Well, Nordic Semiconductor is kind of glomming onto that trend, although it's, it's actually kind of a cool product. They have announced a Bluetooth low energy AC plug-in wireless hub, along with a stick-on beacon for asset tracking. And the idea is that hospitals could use this to remotely track the assets such as ventilators and defibrillators and so on, knowing exactly where they all are. Of course, you got to outfit your whole hospital with these little stickers and these Bluetooth outlets, but still, I think it's clever. Okay. We're all for it. Hospitals don't like to deploy a lot of this stuff because they want to control what's on their network, but we'll, we'll see if the security suffices. Or maybe during a pandemic, they're like, screw security. Ah. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of security, Nest is now requiring two-factor authentication on all of your devices. I got the email recently. I'm sure you did too, Kevin. And yeah, if you haven't done that, now you have to. You should do it. We knew, we knew it was coming. You should not resent it. Do it. 
Speaking of security, Ring has a new $99.99 entry-level doorbell, which I did not see this coming. It's very similar to the Video Doorbell 2. It has a solar charger on top of it, though. I, yeah, I did not see this coming. That's actually kind of nice if you're in the Ring Amazon ecosystem. Yes. And, you know, I'm actually about to move in a few months, and I am eyeballing which, which Ooh, IoT security yeah. doorbell. We're going to hear a lot more about cool stuff. You've got an ecosystem decision to make. Don't get me started. Okay. Mm. I have been thinking about that and going, ooh. Well, you may be moving before this actually hits the market, though. It can be pre-ordered now for the $100. It comes out on June the 3rd. Oh, that actually works for me. But okay. However, what I will not be buying is an automatic OBD port monitor. Not only because that's for my car, not my home, but because automatic is shutting down. Yes, last week we talked about all the companies blaming the pandemic for their closures. And last week on Friday morning, Automatic joined them. Automatic, their device has been around for since like 2013, so a while. And people could buy it up until even, you know, a few months ago. And in 2017, it was bought by Sirius XM. And Sirius basically pushed automatic to you could buy a car at CarMax and get like a service plan where you put the automatic in and you would get details about the health of your car. You could use it for like logging miles. You could do a lot with this. And now they're not going to support it anymore. (laughs) No more cloud service for it. No. This is a little jarring. And Belkin actually did this with their NetCam too, also last week. Basically, they gave their users a month. They said, hey, we're going to shut down operations. After, in Automatic's case, it's May 28th. Belkin, I can't recall, but it's it's like about 30 days. They're like, you get a month, we're going to shut it down. You can pull your data out. That's not enough time. That's that Any company in this space should be giving more time than that. I, I understand the financial challenges and the business challenges, but come on. Yeah, I really think they should be putting money in escrow for stuff like this. At the like, right. Decide how long you think you want to support something. And I think the terms will probably be different depending on how much a device has cost, the difficulty of installation. So, like, How much a, data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you know all that as a company when you're selling the product and the service. So why not at that point figure out how much you need in escrow to give people at least – whatever it is, three months, six months, et cetera. And then as your product mix evolves, you then modify what you have in escrow to account for that. Let's just play a game here. Sure. Automatic. Does that require what? Three months, six months? What do you think? Honestly, at a minimum, I, I think a month is probably the bare minimum. Oh, well, that's um, what they gave. Well, they're given roughly a month. And the reason being, uh, because it doesn't take that long to get your data. And that's about all you can do. If you want to find a replacement, it doesn't take too long to find a replacement. I have ODBD port reader uh, to flash the electronic control unit of my engine in my car to get extra performance. For example, I have all that data. It costs me a lot more. I paid $550 because it has the ability to flash the car software, but and my data is local. Okay. It doesn't take long to get the data. A product like that is not a not a product that you have. You you don't use it every day. Maybe you passively use it by driving your car, but you're not looking at the data every day. Okay, I still would like three months. I'm gonna just say it, it. would be nice. It would so be nice. three months. Uh, let's say a thermostat. Hmm. There's so many of them out there. I don't think I would need much time. Okay. See, I feel like because it's installed in the wall, I would want at least six months, maybe even a year. It's four wires, five wires. Okay, Kevin, you're like... (laughs) Okay. What about your Sonos? It was expensive to buy, and now it's going away. That's a little different because they're really... There are similar products, but that is a very unique product to me, and I do use it every day. I'd want time to get a replacement, not to get any data off of it, but a way to transition to another product. Okay, so your thinking is very different than mine. I like having that perspective. I'm like... All right, a Sonos, I can buy a new one. I do yeah. take into account how much I spent on it, so I would want to see some discounts. Um, sure. Also, how long ago could someone have purchased it? And another word of advice for companies who are shutting stuff down, take your stock out of retail channels, because there's nothing worse than seeing a company closing a product and then being able to buy the product on like Amazon the next day. It's bad. Or if you're going to leave them out there, open source the cloud services. 
Don't do that. Just take them off. <laughs> well, I, I still have. Imagine some poor person trying to like, oh, I bought this. No, 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 no. Oh. So, so I don't mean like so that individuals can try and keep it alive themselves. I think back to my Anki Vector, which has now gained a second life thanks to some people who bought the IP and have servers now and are actively working on new firmware and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about like technical groups that can put a new product out, so to speak. Okay. All right. That concludes that part of the show. Now it is time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline. Dun, 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 dun. The Internet of Things podcast hotline is once again brought to you by Schlage. The best home automation adds convenience, not hassle. With its built-in Wi-Fi, the Schlage Encode Smart Wi-Fi Deadbolt shows just how easy secure can be. Learn more at schlage.com. That's right. Schlage is a returning sponsor. This week, it is time to announce our winner from the April contest. They will be winning a Schlage lock. And the winner is Marshall. Congratulations, Marshall. Woo! Yay! And this month, for the month of May, we have an option for you. Because we know that we are listened to by smart home nerds and just general nerds all alike, your options are going to be you can win a Schlage lock or you could win a helium hotspot. What? Yeah, so Ooh. connected lock for your home, because some people already have these too, or a helium hotspot, which is a LoRaWAN hotspot that you can uh, set up in your house and start earning, I don't know, helium points. <laughs> helium tokens. <laughs> helium people's tokens. network. And also, you know, you if you have LoRa stuff in your house, you can connect your LoRa stuff and you also become part of this like, Worldwide Laura Wayne Network. Exciting. Okay. So those are your two prize options. When you win, you can tell us which one works for you. All right. If you would like to be entered to win, all you have to do is call us and ask us a question at 512-623-7424. And we may answer it on the show, but you will definitely be entered to win. This week's voicemail comes from Don, who's having some Z-Wave issues. Let's hear it. Hey, Stacy and Kevin. This is Don in Northwest Arkansas. I happen to have three of the Schlage lock in uh, in my doors. I also have Insteon and Universal Devices. And the issue I've got is the one, actually two of the doors, one is the closest and one is the furthest, once in a while seem to lose Z-Wave communication with the Universal Devices. My question is, the furthest one is... A little more hit and miss than, than the nearest. But it's sitting next to a steel washer and dryer. So I kind of think that might be my problem. I put a Z-Wave alarm unit plugged into the wall near it, and it seemed to maybe help a little bit, but I wasn't didn't really think it made that big of a difference. My question is, on the other side of that room is another door going into the garage. And I know Z-Wave also does repeating. If I was to put another Schlage lock, or if I accidentally really won this month's Schlage lock, uh, fingers crossed, then that might possibly help it. Or wondered what your opinion would be on that. There are two sheetrock walls, and probably 30 to 35 feet as the, the Z-Wave flies between the lock and my universal devices unit. That's why I wondered if that might possibly help. Love the show. Listen to you guys every week. Thanks a bunch. Bye. Okay, Don. This is... Tricky. This is a, yeah, this is tricky, <laughs> partially because we just don't know exactly what your setup is. But we've got some good suggestions to get you started, and we'd love to hear back from you afterwards. And you can tell us if this worked or not. Z-Wave is a network that really only travels between 10 and 30 feet, depending on the makeup of your house. Mostly the makeup of your house. Right. <laughs> the, the, the type of walls, where you have it, that sort of thing. And it is a true mesh. So if you have one Z-Wave device talking to a hub... You know, it's going to talk directly. But if you have a bunch of Z-Wave devices, they'll create this like mesh topology and they will talk to each other and send the message back and forth. So the more Z-Wave you have, the better and more resilient your network will be. It sounds like you already have some stuff, but it also sounds like maybe it's not in the best place and possibly a little far away. So the first suggestion for you is to buy a Z-Wave repeater. These are like 35 to you can probably find them for like $20, but 35 to $40 Pop a repeater 
near the lock that's furthest away that's causing you problems. And what you can do is wait. And a lot of times after a few days, sometimes it's within an hour, sometimes it takes a while, your network will reconfigure and then it will include that and start working better. So you do need to get a, a little bit of time. Or you could do what I would do, which is rebuild your network. So that's basically take mm-hmm. all your Z-Wave devices off the network, manually exclude them, then put them back in, and then work from there. And to be honest, what I would do if you're going to do that, I definitely think another repeater or two is going to help depending on the placement of them. If you're going to rebuild the network, so to speak, I would start at your hub and work your way out, build it out towards that problem device. So that way, that problem device is connecting to the closest possible Z-Wave access point that's on the network at that time. Yeah. So let us know how that works for you. It's basically reboot and repeaters is our advice to you. But this is without like deeper insights. Right. Without, without knowing the configuration of your home, the walls, what they're made out of, it's tough. We're talking about um, megahertz frequency, I believe. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it should be okay through walls, but still, I mean, you're looking best case 30, 35 feet, probably without walls. So more repeaters is probably your best bet. I mean, it also depends on like, you know, that washer and dryer, that's a giant oh, yeah. box. So it's also what's what's in your house. Yep. So And what other, what other RF is out there? It's exactly. Like, you know, 900 megahertz is used by garage door openers, baby monitors. Old, old wireless phones. <laughs> That's right. Old wireless Some, hey, phones. If, if, listen, if you can tell me that people are still using DVRs, then I think people are still using old wireless phones. Oh, 100%. <laughs> so, that's our advice to you. And thank you for calling in, Don. And remember, you guys, for the month of May, give us a call at 512-623-7424, and you will be entered to win either a Schlage Lock or a Helium Hotspot. And now, let me tell you one quick thing. I think we mentioned it last week, but we are starting to do events for the IoT podcast and Stacey on IoT. And our first event is going to be May 20th. It is going to happen at 11 a.m. PT. 2 p.m. ET. And it's going to be all about why the IoT didn't predict COVID-19 and how we can set up a better system for the future. We're going to have Inder Singh, who is the CEO of Kinza on. We're going to have people from Electra Labs that does clinical validation for consumer wearables. And we're going to have an epidemiologist from Scripps to talk to us on this topic. So sign up there at stacyonioT slash COVID if you are interested in that. And now stay tuned for our guest, Christine Sunu from Twilio. She is going to be talking to us about how to build a connected mailbox open-close sensor. In the process, she's also going to share her thinking and how to get around barriers for anyone who is really wants to build some sort of connected product but is way too intimidated. So this should inspire you to use your quarantine time for making if you want. Before we get to her, let's hear from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Fairy. Hey, everyone. We are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. And today's sponsor is Vary, a leading IoT development services firm. And I have Dr. Jen Gamble, who is the data science practice lead at Vary, here to talk to us. Hi, Jen. How are you today? I'm great, Stacey. How are you? Excellent. So tell me why you joined Vary and what you're doing with data science there. So what originally drew me to Vary is the way that they're a real leader when it comes to agile IoT development practices. This is because what I'm very passionate about is applying agile practices to data science and machine learning development. So uh, this plus the culture fit uh, is what made Vary a great match for me. Now I lead our data science team in machine learning and AI initiatives on our client projects. So in every engagement, we start with a problem formulation and defining the analytical approach. And so we do this by working through a process with our clients where we ask questions like, what data is available? What are the types of statements that we want to be able to make in the application? Uh, Is it predictions, recommendations, even fully automated decision making? Who are the end users going to be? What are the workflows that we're hoping to enable based off of this data? What's even possible from a predictive modeling or machine learning recommendation perspective? And that last part kind of we figure out based off of the data science on the data that's available. And then as we actually build out the end-to-end application, we apply these agile development practices to all aspects of the system that we're building. So that includes the data pipelines and machine learning models as well. 
Wow. All right. So where do you see data science going in the IoT field and how does Vary play a part? Looking at the field today, best practices for agile data science or agile AI app development are just now beginning to be created and adopted. Also, these types of interdisciplinary IoT projects, to execute on them successfully requires a group of data scientists, software engineers, designers, subject matter experts, firmware developers, hardware engineers. All these people need to work together as a cohesive team. And so most enterprise businesses or industrial businesses, even if they have this kind of diverse set of skills already in-house, they don't necessarily have that group of people used to working together for agile IoT product development purposes. And so that's a really non-trivial part of it. And so what we're seeing is a need for specialized IoT development firms, especially ones that can include machine learning and hardware development as part of their core competencies. So Very is positioned to really fill this gap for industrial and enterprise businesses. All right. So Jen, where do I go to learn more about how Very can help me with my IoT project? You can reach out to us at verypossible.com slash Stacy. So that's V-E-R-Y P-O-S-S-I-B-L-E dot com slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacy Hagenbotham, and today's guest is Christine Sidhu, who works with IoT community engagement at Twilio. Hi Christine, how are you doing today? I'm great, Stacey. It's fantastic to be here. I am really excited. As I promised everyone earlier, we are going to talk about how to get over the, I bought a board, now what hump? We'll get this started just by having you tell us a little bit about what you do at Twilio and maybe about your latest project, which I actually want because I really could use a fitness tracker for my sourdough starter. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So at Twilio, I lead the developer community for the Internet of Things side of uh, Twilio's product offerings. So Twilio offers a lot of things to developers that are super interesting. You know, it started out as a lot of communications that had to do with your phone. How do we write applications and really like use things that we would normally code in our computers to reach people uh, where they are with their phone numbers or with their landlines or <laughs> whatever it is that we wanted to do. How do we incorporate SMS? How do we incorporate video? How do we incorporate all of these things that feel occasionally like they are certainly a part of the world of tech and communications, but they feel like they are further from us when we're, you know, writing applications and apps. So it's funny because in that context of, you know, this weird amorphous tech world and the expanding, ever expanding sphere of communications <laughs> and the overlap there. It seems natural that there would be these Internet of Things related things at Twilio. So Twilio does a couple of things in IoT. I mean, there's always the very classic thing that you can do uh, with Twilio, which is reach people where they are by by having by sending texts programmatically through your application. So that makes it really easy for you to have any of your devices <laughs> text you. And then, you know, there's also um, cellular connectivity offered through SIMS. And so Twilio has a number of options for that, including narrowband and programmable wireless. And then this really cool uh, product that's coming out called SuperSIM. I will admit to being a little short-sighted when I think about IoT projects, I don't often think about using phones, which is silly because a lot of the projects I work with, I do want to have some sort of notification. I'm just like, oh, I'd rather have a light bulb. I don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, on the developer network, there's a lot of people who have spent a lot of time in technology, and it's a really fun team. And I had this whole discussion with one of my teammates about just do phones even count as IoT? Because a lot of times when, um, you know, if I'm doing a talk or I'm talking to somebody who asks me, like, Christine, what even is IoT? You know, I'll shorthand it by saying, well, it's like the internet being on stuff that isn't phones or computers. And what does that really offer us? You know, and you get into like a lot of the interesting things about industrial applications and ambient computing and notifications that aren't the kind of notifications that we associate with phones and notifications that can move into our lives and our space more naturally and more easily. And so it's certainly a debate, I think, <laughs> whether or not phone notifications qualify as IoT. But there's also, you know, the the other side, rather than the output, the input side, that in some ways, like your smartphone is a very worthy way to monitor 
your movement, your like not just your location, but also, you know, are you like currently bouncing around? Are you running? Are you <laughs> in a light place or a dark place? There's tons of sensors on your phone that do a lot of the things that we talk about IoT devices doing at a smaller, at a more specific scale. So it's a very interesting debate. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I will say a good example of bringing the phone into this actually is the project that you just got a lot of publicity seems mean. I, it, it's not. <laughs> it's just a cool project. And people are like, hey, this is a cool project. So a lot of people wrote about it. So maybe if you explain what you did with Soured IO, is that how yeah. I should say it? Soured.io? Yes. Yeah. So I am the I am like a, a crazy cat lady, but for sourdough starters. So I was already really into uh, making bread and, and having starters way before it became not to be like a hipster about it before everybody started doing it. I think that there's I think that there's something that's really lovely about having this interesting culture of yeast and flour and water and you feed it and it, it grows and it makes bread and it's kind of changing over time, but still totally the same. And, you know, it's it's a it's like a pet that you have that makes you bread. And so it's not really surprising that everybody loves that and is, is comforted by that now. And I had had a lot of really silly designs over the years for monitoring my sourdough starters or reminding me to feed them or, you know, figuring out ways for, for me to make sure that I was I was caring for them or just getting more data because I'm, I'm from a, I have a science background. So I like just having data. And so I was uh, realizing that this is the first time ever that anybody is interested in hearing about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I might as well actually build it. So yeah, so this was a good chance for you to build it. And briefly, I guess you should tell people what it is that you built. Yeah, so I built a little device that screws onto the top of a canning jar. And it just looks like a little face. So it attaches to, to a canning lid and you can put your starter in the jar, put the lid on with the device on it, and it will monitor the temperature, humidity, and rise of your sourdough starter. So as your starter grows, it pings it with a distance sensor to see how tall it is. And then it also uh, takes data on the temperature and the humidity in the jar. Well, let's talk about getting started then, since as you as you have, a lot of our audience has some extra time and maybe they're trying to trying to complete a project. And I would love to help them out by getting you to talk about your process. So how do you approach a project from idea to completion? And I know we were talking before the show about like maybe the big barriers to entry. So I don't know if you have a process and you want to start there, or if maybe you want to talk about what you see as the big barriers, but we probably should start there and help, then help people get over it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, when, before I worked for Twilio, I was actually doing end-to-end -end product design um, and consulting for hardware and other things. So, you know, how do you take an idea and turn it into something that's real or turn it into a prototype or really flush it out in a way that you feel like it's it's something. And I truly think that the process is the same, whether you are one person doing it or whether you are a giant company doing it. I think that a lot of it is thinking about your goals and what you want to get out of it and then getting started. I a lot of times encourage people when their individuals just trying to get started in something like hardware, there's just so much information out there, you know, it, it helps a lot to start with a project and to have something in mind. And from there, you kind of break down what are the inputs for IoT, what are the inputs and the outputs, and what is the easiest way to build them. It can be tremendously difficult to do this if you haven't done it before, <laughs> you haven't done it a lot. So that's one of the that's one of the tricky parts. Most of that, I think, is that when you get started, you don't know what to Google. There's so much information. <laughs> It's just very difficult to know what to Google to, to find exactly what you need. It's hard to know what things are called. I feel like I am. I used to ask people when I was getting started in hardware, I would tell them, I don't need to take up a lot of your time. I don't need you to teach me the whole thing. I just need you to tell me what to Google. So a lot of times when people, other people are getting started in, in hardware and they ask me what they should do, I also tell them like, by the way, if ever you need, just ask me, I will tell you what to Google. <laughs> that can really get you unstuck in a way that that's tremendously helpful. Awesome. So let's, let's work through a project. And this is actually an idea that's going to come straight from our listeners, because we get a lot of questions about this. So and I, I think it might be simple. We get a lot of people who want to set up 
some sort of mailbox sensor, or maybe it's a someone is coming up my driveway sensor. Both of those objects are fairly far away from their house, so it's not within Wi-Fi distance. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking one end, you've got the sensor that's going to say, oh, hey, someone drove by your driveway. Or maybe it's an open close on a mailbox. And then thinking about like how to connect that to a network and then how to communicate that something happened back at the homestead. Does that feel like a good project? All right. What do I do? In the current era, I would definitely think about starting with what you have. It can be tricky to get materials right now. It can be tricky to get sensors. I think if you have boards at home, if you have things that you maybe got at a conference and they're just sitting in a drawer somewhere, that's a really good place to start. So (laughs) uh, what do you have? So I have nothing. So what should I buy to make a mailbox open close sensor? Please lay it out for me. Any IoT project is going to have three parts. It's going to have hardware, firmware, and software. Hardware is the device, how you set up the device, how it's wired, what sensors you use, etc. How is it enclosed, things like that. Firmware is the code that is sitting on the device that takes and translates everything and like gets it ready to be sent out and also communicates with the modem if there's a modem and says like, all right, we're going to get ready to send all of this data somewhere. Software is can mean a lot of things, but in this case, I'm using it to mean the side of our IoT application that's going to handle the data that was sent to the internet by our device. So those are the three parts. In the case of this mailbox monitor, we're going to have our hardware be a photoresistor so we can sense the amount of light that is in the mailbox, a microcontroller, so something that's going to help us translate this arbitrary number that's coming in from the the photoresistor into a yes or no, I think the mailbox is open or closed, and also a modem. So the microcontroller will communicate with the modem so that it can send that information over the internet. The firmware that is sitting on the device is going to do what I just said the microcontroller is doing because it sits on the, on the, the microcontroller. It's going to read the photoresistor, take that number, turn it into something that we can actually use and send that information over the internet by telling the modem certain commands. So that takes care of hardware and firmware. And then on the software side, we need to receive that information in our cloud. We need to handle it. We need to tell it where to go from there. We need to send it to the phone. We need to send it to the lights. And there's a number of services we can do for that. So it it can be really hard to know what to Google. So I'm just going to tell you what to Google at every stage. (laughs) So first, you need a Google photoresistor. A photoresistor tells you essentially how much light there is, and it changes the resistance based on the amount of light. We're going to use the photoresistor to tell us um, whether the mailbox is open or closed, since a mailbox is dark when it's closed and light when it's open. What you really want to Google here is photoresistor simple circuit diagram, or photoresistor Arduino diagram. This will tell you how to hook up your photoresistor to your Arduino and what kind of resistor you need to ground the photoresistor, which is a whole thing that that simple Google will also get into. All right. Now we need to connect it to the internet. Mm -hmm. What do I Google for that? So we're going to Google MQTT library Arduino, or if you don't have an Arduino, Google MQTT library, whatever it is that you have. So what we're going to do now just to like play with it is we're gonna set up a circuit. So you just set up the circuit, um, you read the photoresistor and then get that good uh, confidence boost of like, I totally did it, this was amazing, pat yourself on the back. It's been like, you built a really good circuit and it works and you're reading the photoresistor. So this is like the, the foundation and then we're gonna work from there. So now that we have this, we could hypothetically put this in our mailbox and it could our mailbox could open and close and we would know when it was open and closed. But what we wouldn't be able to do is receive that information over anything except for a wire. So let's let's get a modem. Let's get cellular in there. So now what we're going to Google is, uh, let's say it's an Arduino. So for Arduino, the add-ons are called shields. So we're going to Google Arduino cellular shield. I'm actually going to Google that now. So there's a couple of things that come up. There's a GSM shield. There's a Adafruit Fona shield. Um, we're going to just look for anything that's, that's really simple that is going to allow us to send this information. You can also... If you're thinking about what to buy, because that's really going to be the practical thing for us, go to Adafruit or SparkFun or wherever you like to shop and look up uh, Cellular Shield for whatever dev board you have. And then make sure that you remember that name or that you have that name there because our subsequent Googles are going to involve that name. So let's say that I'm using this Cellular Shield that comes from SparkFun. So this is a SparkFun Cat M1 and 
narrowband IoT shield. And so I believe that we can just place this directly onto our Arduino and it should work. Yeah, that's that side. What we're going to need here is uh, what you're going to want to do once you order this or once you get it is you're going to want to look up all of the libraries related to this that allow it to connect. So the next thing that we're going to do is whatever whatever recommended setup for this phone. So we're going to set our photoresistor and our resistor to the side for a moment. And we're going to do the setup for this modem. Um, and there's typically like a very simple sample code that already exists. There's typically an MQTT example that already exists. And then you should be able, it should, it should show you the very basic basics of sending any information over the internet using the cellular board. After you do that, go get a sandwich, take a break, eat some ice cream, feel good about yourself. You just connected a thing to the internet. That is super cool. (laughs) Um, The next part is one of my favorites because we're going to Frankenstein these two pieces of code together. And we're going to take the code that we wrote before that uh, allowed us to read the photoresistor and uh, decide when the mailbox was open. And we are going to put that together with our cellular connect to the internet talk with MQTT code. And then we will be sending our data over the internet with MQTT from our device to wherever we want. That sounds awesome. Okay. I I feel very confident that I can do all this. So now, now let's say I want to send it to my phone from my MQTT feed, I guess is the way to think of it. How do I connect that to maybe a service like IFT, or maybe I have to do, I want to avoid writing as much actual code as possible. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm right there with you. So let's say that we sent, that our broker that we used was um, Adafruit IO. This is sort of like us cheating here. We're just gonna, you know, you don't have to Google for this one. <laughs> Hypothetically, you could at this point Google MQTT broker and MQTT broker IFT and MQTT broker no code. <laughs> which would all be excellent ways for, for you to find something that some setup that might work. But let's let's just use uh, Adafruit IO as an example, since I'm pretty sure that that one does work. Okay, so now let's go to IFT and let's set up a service. So the service is going to take the information from our feed at Adafruit IO and do whatever we want with it. So if we get this published, then we are going to send a text or then we are going to turn on the light somewhere. So now we've got like a great no code thing that, uh, at least on the software side, that's taking the info from our device and doing cool IoT stuff with it. That sounds awesome. So this sounds eminently plausible and like something I could actually do with very minimal costs. So you, you did mention now that we've gone through a project, are there places where people tend to get stuck and do you have any advice for them? Yes. So I think that... One of the places where people get stuck, I mean, honestly, just like discussing this right now, it's it's clear that one of the, the trickier places is figuring out the firmware side and the libraries and the publishes. It's actually not as scary as I felt that it was when I first started looking at it years ago. But I think that it's very intimidating, especially if you're if you're not used to code um, and if you're just trying to get something up and running quickly. That movement from the I got something working um, over the wire, I got something working on my Arduino that I can read something over serial, like it's doing a serial log and I just get it. That's a it's a really big step to go from there to I have it sending something over the internet. There's like a number of things that can go wrong with cellular specifically. I would say, give it time and it might not be you. (laughs) So there's, there's this issue where sometimes it take with cellular connections, it can take it a little while to come online, especially the first time it comes online, the first time it does that handshake. So when the first time you set up your cellular thing, if it doesn't come online immediately, if you're not getting it to connect to the internet immediately, you know, you can try resetting it and waiting it for the same amount of time. But if it still doesn't do it, just like get up, you know, go for a walk, get a glass of water, stretch, do a little yoga, <laughs> take some deep breath. It's really, sometimes it just takes a little while and then come back to it and check it out and it might just be online. The other side is uh, you can also consider prototyping fully offline and looking for solutions that solve some of the published steps for you. When I was at Particle, one of the reasons why we created a platform that had built in publish and subscribe is because it can be very intimidating for people to get started with hardware, software, firmware, 
and everything else all at once. Um, and it can be a lot easier if you just say, okay, we, we've handled at least one part of this for you. So there are certain providers like Particle where some of the, the uh, function calls are all done for you. So the firmware is already set in a way that you don't have to go in and mess with it too much. So Particle is a bit sandboxed in that way. It will make it so that all you have to do on the firmware side, rather than including a lot of MQTT libraries and trying to, to do that, is you just tell it Particle Publish or Particle Subscribe to receive information, um, Particle Publish to push information. And then you can, in the, your dashboard, I believe this is still true, you can just hook it up as like a webhook and immediately have it go to ift. So our pipe would be we have our device, we set it up so that it's just like whatever default firmware that that particle is sent with it. And then we hook up the photoresistor and then we can immediately start doing it. Actually, I think if you get the electron kit, it comes with a photoresistor and a resistor <laughs> for the photon kit. So then you would just be able to do this entire project. <laughs> I could just fire that sucker up, throw it in my mailbox, and we are done. Basically, it, I, I actually drew the diagram that's on the photon kit. It used to come shipped. I don't 